Thank you all for being here, taking time out of your weekend, out of your schedules, out of your lives to join me for this. And I hope that you will get a payoff and, and learn something about the long view about water and climate in Colorado and also about the old trees that tell us so much about what has happened in the past. Uh, so, so Linda explained that I have a, a bachelor's from here and a master's from the University of Montana. I don't have a PhD. I think I'm the only uh, lecturer in this program series who is not a full-time faculty. So I am uh, e extremely glad to be out of the office, out of the lab, and speaking to a group. I uh, you know, don't have a regular teaching gig. And so normally I'm inflicting these PowerPoints on people like water managers and uh, forest managers, public officials. Things are a little more tense than they would be in this kind of environment. So I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Uh, I also, not being faculty, represent a class of people that you uh, may not uh, think about at CU and who do a lot of the, uh, the research, you might say the grunt work, uh, across the different departments and particularly the research institutes on campus. Uh, formally, the university calls us professional research assistants. Uh, we can uh, get other titles through our institute or department. I'm senior research associate at, at Western Water Assessment. Uh, but it's those of us without PhDs, but are still very much uh, part and parcel of sort of the research apparatus uh, and the intellectual uh, diversity of the university. So I'm grateful too to kind of represent uh, that group in speaking to you today. Um, before I, I start, I need to acknowledge not individually, but uh, at least point to uh, the fact that what I'm going to talk about for the next few hours is, is the product of uh, the, the work and, and sweat and effort of uh, many dozens of people. Um, and it really starts with Connie Woodhouse, who uh, was my uh, supervisor uh, when I was with the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research from 1999 to 2009. Um, she directed the dendrochronology lab, the tree ring lab, which I was manager of. She's now at the University of Arizona. I still collaborate with her on several projects. And then uh, many other agency and university collaborators who have energized our work, uh, partners at different resource management agencies, and then you can't leave out the funding, uh, much of it from NOAA. So, uh, First, uh, maybe this group doesn't need this, this justification, but I, I like to start with why, why do we need the long view? Why would we bother to uh, you know, poke these poor innocent trees and, and grab their, their records of past climate? You know, why do we need that information? And then how does the tree actually do it? How does it tell us uh, useful and interesting things about past climate and water availability? Um, how do we kind of the nuts and bolts of how do we build a what we call a reconstruction of past climate and stream flow and and then okay let's look at these these records that the trees give us and what do they tell us uh, about past climate and water how do they kind of inform the present and and then the future what do the trees tell us about you know potential strategies planning for the future so why do we need the long view and i would argue that our observed records of gauged records of stream flow, instrumental records of climate, you know, in this part of the world, very seldom more than 100 years old, um, 100 years long, that's inadequate to capture the range of past variability. And so I'll start by flogging a record that you'll see a lot of, and this is the Colorado River at Lee's Ferry, Arizona, which is the entire Colorado River Basin, the upper Colorado River Basin, and 70% of the flow at Lee's Ferry, even though it's in Arizona, 70% is coming from western Colorado. All of the western slope of the state drains into the Colorado. Wyoming sends down some, a little bit from Utah, but it's mostly western Colorado. And so from 1900 to 1930, uh, the flows seem to vary around a mean of about 17 million acre feet. And it was largely on this basis that the waters of the Colorado River were divided in the Colorado River Compact of 1922, assuming a baseline, well, at least well above 15 million acre feet. So what happened in the next 40 years is that now suddenly appeared to be an anomaly. Um, and you could say, well, either the, the baseline should be much lower or more frighteningly, there's this significant downward trend um, we see some very low flows that were certainly not experienced in the first 30 years. Um, 
so could we judge the future? Could we judge, do we have enough uh, information about the variability in the system from a 70 year record? And the answer is no, uh, because in the 30 odd years after that, we had the two lowest flows in the entire sequence, 1977 and 2002, the two highest flows, 1983 and 84, and this interesting kind of quasi-decadal oscillation where it stays relatively high flow for a decade and then low and then back. And now, uh, at the very end there, that's this past water year, 2011, which is very high, over 20 million acre feet. We may follow it this year with a flow well below 10 million acre feet, um, which has, I think, one precedent here. Um, 100 years of data, do we have enough information? And I would argue, no, we don't. So how do we get it? How do we um, sort of get more experience, you know, longer glimpse of what this particular climate water system can throw out at us without you know, waiting for that experience to come to us. Well, this is where the branch of climate science called paleoclimatology comes in. We use uh, mostly environmental proxies, but also uh, historical records to analyze pre-instrumental climate. And there are a lot of different environmental proxies, lake sediments, pack, you know, the vegetation collected by pack rats, uh, pollens from different sediments, clamshells, ice cores, you may be familiar with. And, and tree rings. So what tree rings bring to the table, um, none of these attributes are unique to tree rings, but the whole set is. Uh, annual resolution, so annual rings, so we have an annual record of past climate and hydrology. Long continuous records, um, you know, over you know, a couple thousand years from the same tree, up to 10,000 years from a set of trees spliced together. Uh, widespread distribution, you may have noticed there are trees all over the landscape, all over the world. And then very high sensitivity and fidelity to climate variability, and I'll hope to demonstrate that. So tree rings give us that, that longer view of past climate variability, and I call it hindsight. You know, without the, having to manage your system through a thousand years, uh, you can, through tree rings, get, in this case, a t over a 1,200-year record. This is one of the, the latest tree ring reconstructions of the Colorado River uh, at Lee's Ferry. And suddenly, the, the gauge record doesn't look quite as comprehensive. <laughs> and, and so what do we see when we look at, at this longer window? Well, you'll have to wait, and we'll talk about that in about an hour and a half. But first, how do we get there? How do we get from the tree out in the field to this construct? Well, the first thing we need to, to look at is the biology of trees. And you know, trees are these incredible, uh, these incredible entities. They're rooted in place. They have to deal with the conditions you know, occurring right there where they started growing. And they're constantly uh, interacting with their environment. Um, they have to interact with, with sun to, uh, to form carbohydrates through photosynthesis from which all of their growth and other processes occur. And then in the process of conducting photosynthesis, they have to use and, and release water and oxygen back into the atmosphere. Um, so they're kind of you know, using, using, it's almost like a water allocation system that they have. I'm calling it growth. It's also really water too. And there are a number of different systems or parts that they have to allocate water to uh, and growth. And some are more important than others. And of course, trees, like any organism that's been around a long time, has a very well honed, you might say, algorithm or internal mechanism for allocating you know, what, what should I do when? They don't think about it, obviously, but they have this, uh, this algorithm that says, oh, this is a higher priority than this. And so, um, you've got foliage, you've got reproductive structures like cones, uh, resins that help keep out insects and, and heal wounds, uh, diameter growth, fine roots and the mycorrhizal fungi that form symbiotic relationships with the fine roots to help bring in water and nutrients. Uh, if you're a young tree, uh, height growth is important. And you obviously need to grow branches too, and then the larger roots as well. What do you think are the highest priorities here? 
you know, something that the, every year, no matter what conditions are, the trees have to put a lot of their resources into that. Which roots? The fine ones. Okay, so what is lost every year is the question. Well, evergreen trees do lose needles. They keep them for a longer time than deciduous trees, but a tree has to regrow the foliage that it loses, like a ponderosa pine or a Douglas fir might lose a third or a fifth of its needles every year. Those have to be regrown if the tree is going to survive. The fine roots last at most a season. Those need to be regrown every year, and those take an awful lot of energy. Reproductive structures, very important, obviously, or the species will not persist. Um, those cones, the cone cycle may be you know, longer, not necessarily every year. Um, diameter growth is actually about the lowest priority. Uh, the tree has to keep growing enough to keep up with height growth, because if it's too skinny, it'll get knocked over in the wind. Um, but diameter growth, it turns out, is kind of like the residual. It's luxury growth. It, it's what the tree puts its energy into once it's taken care of just about everything else. And since diameter growth is the annual rings, the tree rings that we're looking at, that means they are likely to be very sensitive to the environmental conditions and how they change from year to year. So how did they grow? And here I'm, I'm, and really the entire rest of this course, I'll be talking about conifers. Uh, hardwood or angiosperm species have a, a somewhat different uh, anatomy and morphology. Some of this will apply, some won't. I can't really cover both. So we're really talking about conifers here. In this case, this is a, a Douglas fir. And um, all of the action is taking place every growing season here in this very thin strip. It's really one, two cells wide, the cambium. Uh, and that's where this, during the growing season, the cells at that kind of li the living, the bleeding edge of the tree divide. And the ones on the inside become the new wood, the annual ring, the wood, or it's called xylem, and form these annual rings. The cells that divide, if they're on the outside, they become the phloem or inner bark and then eventually the outer bark. When we look at a cross-section of a tree and we see light and dark, the light is the wood that is formed from the cambium in the, maybe the first two-thirds of the growing season. So say very roughly June, July, maybe a little of May. And then as things start to slow down in, in late summer, the cells, the tracheids, uh, have thicker walls and they're a little smaller. So it's the same material but it appears darker. And we call this the late wood, so early wood, late wood. And it's the combination of the two that forms one annual ring. And then of course, uh, you know, September, sometimes October at the lower elevations, the growing season ends and you have a dormant period. And then the cambium, oh, it's all happening here, and the cambium will pick up and start dividing again at the beginning of the next growing season. Uh, we can see, even in this very young tree, about seven years old, uh, that there is incredible variation in the ring widths uh, from year to year. So the question, what is it responding to? Any questions about this? Because there's more on here than I am explaining right now. Okay. Um, oh, yes. And then if you look at a, a larger cross-section of a tree, a tree that's at least 40, 50, 80 years old, you'll notice that there are two types of wood, or xylem. Um, you've got the lighter colored wood, and then the darker colored wood. It's sap wood and heartwood. And the difference between the two, it all starts as, sta as sap wood. That is, it can, is, the tracheids, the cells are open, the kind of these straws that you know, finger together and extend up from the roots to the foliage of the tree. Um, but after some period of time, and this, might be 50, 80, 100, 150 years, depending on the species and the individual tree, the tree will fill those cells with gums, resins, tannins, and, and so they no longer have the ability to transport water. They're purely structural. And so it makes it darker, also makes it a lot more resistant to rot. And so when you see stumps, old stumps, 
usually the sapwood is gone, and what you're left with is the heartwood, and that's actually very important to uh, hear all of the pieces that I have up front, these old pieces of dead or remnant wood are only the, the heartwood. The sapwood is long gone. You know, very important while the tree is alive, but once the tree dies, it has very little resistance to decay. So back to the, uh, why the rings are so varying in, in width. Um, so we have this principle that extends throughout biology, uh, also sometimes called Liebig's Law of the Minimum, principle of limiting factors, that a biological process cannot proceed faster than it is allowed by its most limiting factor. And so what do you suppose is the limiting factor in, in Colorado, where we have this rather harsh climate? Well, it depends somewhat on the elevation. Now, if you're up near tree line, uh, you, annually you might get 30, 40, 50 inches of precipitation. Moisture is not so limiting, but energy availability is. That is the length and the warmth of the growing season. And so the trees growing near tree line, spruce, and in some cases bristlecone and others, um, will be sensitive to temperatures during the growing season. Uh, what we're going to be talking about most of the rest of the afternoon is what goes on at the lower and middle elevations, where warmth is not limiting, but moisture sure is. So uh, that elevational break is sort of between 9 and 10,000 feet in Colorado, where the trees kind of flip from being mostly or entirely moisture limited to being energy limited. But there's always this zone where we'll core a tree and we'll look at it and we'll say, well, this correlates with moisture pretty well, but it also correlates with temperature. And it's very hard to pull those apart going back in time. Um, moisture availability, you're probably aware from living in Colorado any length of time. It varies enormously from year to year. Here's a record of annual precipitation in western Colorado. Uh, varies uh, over twofold over this 100-year record and, and sometimes 50% or more from year to year. That's a lot of variation that the tree is dealing with and the annual growth, the diameter growth, will reflect that. Um, so for most trees in Colorado then, Unless you're right up near tree line, looking at an Engelman spruce that's well watered, everything, everyone else, when we have dry conditions, a dry year, like in 1977, we end up with a narrow ring, and wet conditions, like in 1983, uh, we get a wide ring. And I call this the moisture signal, kind of this pattern of wide and narrow rings that corresponds very nicely to less or more moisture. Now, what may not be intuitive is that the trees respond not so much to the conditions during the growing season as to what happens for the six, nine, 12 months prior to the growing season. And so this is a, I'm sorry, it's a correlation chart, positive correlations mean there's a positive relationship uh, between, in this case, pinion pine annual growth at one site in western Colorado and monthly precipitation. So I'm saying, how does say previous October's precipitation correlate with current year's growth that of course occurs during the growing season? So you can see that the tree has a, at least a statistical response to precipitation that's falling from the previous September all the way through into June and July. How is it responding to precipitation that hasn't occur, or occurred before the growing season? In part, it's, it's being stored in snow and ice, but even if that snow and ice melts, what's happening to it? It's in the soil. So really, it's the soil that is integrating the moisture that falls over a longer period of time, and then the tree is uptaking it just during the growing season, but the growth reflects a longer period depending on how this, the capacity of the soil. And even in the most barren, rocky locations, as, as I know this site was in western Colorado where these pinyon pines were, you still get some element of soil moisture storage that allows the tree to respond to precipitation long prior to the growing season. You see also that it is not responding at all to precipitation during August at the end of the growing season. Even though the tree is still growing, 
it's like the growth is pretty well locked in at this point. It's not going to respond either positively or negatively to what happens in August. It's already been, you might say, preconditioned by what occurred the previous fall, winter, spring, and early summer. That makes sense? So the, the result then is that the annual growth really reflects annual moisture availability. Um, even though the growth occurs during maybe a three to four month summer season, it's really kind of integrating because of the soil, uh, you know, nine, 12 months, sometimes longer uh, of worth of precipitation that falls in that location. And we can see here, I, this is in green, the widths, just the kind of the raw measured widths of a single pinion pine tree growing on Grand Mesa in Western Colorado. And I'm correlating it with uh, Western Colorado precipitation from August to July. So again, that previous fall all the way through the first, say, two-thirds of the growing season. And you can see how well that matches. This is a single tree. So we have very, very good raw material to work with in constructing records of past climate. The trees in Colorado, I mean, really, if you look globally, this is really one of the sweet spots of the moisture signal across the world. And that's why a lot of this work has been done in the interior west and the southwest. So there's another very important uh, implication of trees being so sensitive to climate. And, and that is, because if, if you think about one site, and here this is in El Dorado Canyon State Park just down the road, and we've got a nice stand of old Douglas firs, they're really, they're all experiencing the same climate. Um, they might be growing on slightly different microsites, different topography, you know, different shading from other trees. The soil might be a little deeper, thinner, one place or another, but they're really all experiencing the same climate. Thus, they are showing that same moisture signal, the same patterns of wide and narrow rings. And this is what separates dendrochronology or tree ring science from just ring counting, is we are cross-matching those patterns from tree to tree within a site. And in so doing, we can absolutely date every ring to the nearest year. So two different trees, and look how similar those patterns are, particularly, we would call this a very nice marker year, very dry year in 1925, much narrower ring than the others, but so wide in 21, narrow in 22, kind of medium in 23, 24, and then boom. So if I'm looking at any tree, ponderosa pine, Douglas fir, uh, in, the front range. I can look for 1925, and that marker year is going to be there in just about every tree. Unless, of course, it's missing. If, if moisture is so poor in a given year, the tree might not put on an annual ring even over either the entire trunk or just a portion of it. We call that locally absent. And that really tells you that that's luxury or residual growth. The tree doesn't even bother putting on diameter growth. 2002, maybe a third of all of the trees we sampled across Colorado in the several years since then did not have an annual ring for 2002. I mean, we're, we're coring on dry sites, as you'll see. So how do we know that, two, that 2002 is not there? Well, there's a break in the pattern. You know, there's, there would be no narrow ring where we would expect to see one based on every other tree in that area. So cross-dating is really kind of the, the, the central procedure for tree ring science of all kinds, not just to reconstruct past climate. It's that, uh, that confident assignment of absolute calendar dates to each ring. Um, as I just suggested, cross-dating extends regionally too, because the patterns of climate extend regionally. Uh, when you have a wet winter, or dry winter, um, those effects can be seen across a large region. And here, we're just showing in the upper right-hand corner uh, kind of a classic pattern in the southwestern four states, narrow rings in 1748, 1750, 1752. And that triplet is diagnostic you know, all across Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. Another key implication of cross-dating is we are not limited to living trees, where we're count, you know, kind of counting back from the bark and matching the patterns from a known date at the bark. We can splice in 
dead wood from archaeological context, just from wood lying on the ground or a standing snag, and kind of build the chronology back in time. Um, you know, hopefully, ideally anchored to the present using living trees, um, but sometimes you can even float a site. It doesn't extend to the present as long as it corresponds well to sort of the regional signal. Um, annual growth or ring width is, is you know, hugely valuable. It's kind of in the, the main uh, way we, we use trees to look at past climate, but in, increasingly in the last, say, 20 years, um, there's been new work using stable isotopes of carbon and oxygen um, to look at moisture status and temperature. Uh, and the density of the late wood, the dark portion of the annual ring, um, can reflect the summer warmth in those energy limited trees near tree line better than the ring width itself. So those can complement the information we get from ring widths. I won't talk much more about those. So this is, uh, in addition to us being in a sweet spot in, in Colorado in the interior west, we're also blessed by these three species which have you know, generally wonderful moisture signals and are uh, very well distributed across the state and live to very great ages too. Douglas fir, ponderosa pine, and pinyon pine. And of course, Douglas fir and, and ponderosa pine are, you know, probably comprise you know, well over half of the, tr the native conifers in Boulder County. Pinyon pine we don't have in Boulder. It, it grows in the southern front range. There is an outlier stand up north of Fort Collins at Owl Canyon. Has anyone been there? That is a really cool spot. Unfortunately, there's a quarry that's taken out, you know, some fraction of the stand. But, and then, of course, all of these are, are present on the West Slope and elsewhere in Colorado, uh, too. How old do you suppose these trees are? Anyone guess on this one, this Doug fir? Not, not the little one, the big one. How old? Just shout it out. You know, if, I can't remember the price is right. You can't go too high, right? Well, well, no one's blown it yet. This tree is 700 years old. 700 years old. That's probably about 30 feet high, maybe 16 inches at the base. That's Dillon Reservoir in the background, by the way. So just on the west slope. Um, how about that Ponderosa? That one I'm taking more of a guess because I didn't core that tree. 300 or higher? 500, about 500 years. Uh, and that pinyon pine, you probably know what territory we're in now. You're, you're, I, I like that direction. You're thinking, hi, 1,500 years. That's probably about 700 years as well. So all three of these species, um, kind of typical old trees will be between 300 and 600 years. If we're lucky, we'll find them in the six to 800 year. And the maximum ages in Colorado are around 900 years. Though in southern Wyoming, we found a dead, standing dead Douglas fir that had 1,040 rings on it. So, and I've heard tales, numerous tales in uh, southwestern Colorado of Ponderosa over 1,000 years as well. Um, but uh, it's just incredible that we have this resource. Yes, question? What about Ah, next slide. So, <laughs> So I call these the big three, and I probably, of all of the time I've spent working with tree rings um, in Colorado and the interior west, you know, probably 90% has been with these three species. Um, but we do have other moisture sensitive species. Um, the signal is not as good everywhere, but if you find them on the right spots, um, and they live longer than these other three. Uh, so bristlecone pine, and this is the Rocky Mountain bristlecone, not the the Great Basin bristlecone, which can live to almost 5,000 years. Um, bristlecone pine can live over 2,000. Uh, anyone guess this tree? Here I'm kind of guessing too. I can't remember which one this is. 1,500. That's pretty close. I'll go with 1,500. And one way you can tell is it's lost a lot of the, the living cambium. It's, it's uh, assumed what's called a strip bark form. And that happens in bristlecone and limber pine that are over 1,000 years old. Um, but it's got too much canopy for it to be 2,000. So 1,500 is a good guess. How about that limber pine right there? This is, 
Cody, who's about 6'4". So this is a big tree. It's about four feet across at the base. Yeah. Uh, I think the oldest limber pines in Colorado are about 13, 14, and this is in that territory, about 1,300 years old. This is a really wonderful spot uh, near Fair Play, up um, along Four Mile Creek on the way to uh, Mount Sherman. And it's actually called, the Forest Service has it signed uh, for Old Limber Grove, I think. It's right next to a campground. And then juniper, a couple different species. We've got Rocky Mountain juniper on the front range, a couple different species in the west slope. Um, that tree, I'm guessing, uh, we didn't core them at this site. I'm guessing that's about 500 years old. They can live over 1,000 as well. So, are, are some of the bristle cone pines too high and then they're not moisture sensitive? That was what we thought. Um, and that it, it was kind of the canonical view of bristlecone pine is, you know, because their, their range, you know, the absolute bottom is about 9,000 feet, uh, right up to tree line. And a lot of them are closer to tree line than, than 9,000. And so we assumed, well, these are temperature sensitive. We're not so interested in them. But if you find them on dry sites, and they like to be on dry sites, um, you know, south facing and in parts of the mountains that are more uh, rain shadowed, like in South Park, you know, around Fair Play, in the, uh, in the southwest, sorry, southeast part of the San Juans, near Monta Vista, I'll show a few trees. We found we could get good moisture sensitivity all the way to tree line, which was quite surprising. <coughs> Yep. Can those samples be used in the same way? You know, it's a great question because I was brought in to look at those, that, some of that wood, which was an incredible experience to see it. It's, um, you know, it's been sitting in this, this bog in anoxic conditions, so non, um, you know, uh, decaying conditions, but they're totally saturated. So it does not have the quality of, of this kind of wood. It's, it's kind of mushy. And so the question was, if we let it dry out, will it be stable or not? And that's really, I, I don't know quite the answer to that. Um, I've got a colleague who has been kind of experimenting with some test samples to see if we can section them and glue them to boards and maybe stabilize them with more glue, let them dry out and then sand them and work with them as normally. It's not clear. But this wood is between 40,000 and 130,000 years old. And it's still the original wood, it's just, it's weaker, softer, however you want to say it. The lignin is probably broken down somewhat. And so, about just yes, so there has been dendrochronology done very much like I'll show today, done on fossilized wood where it's been mineralized and the structure is intact. It's just been, it's now the minerals instead of the original uh, carbon-based material. But as long as the ring structure is still present, you can, you, obviously more difficult to work with to surface it, but you can look at the rings and measure them and do analyses just like I'll show today. So the 35 million year old uh, redwoods from Fluorescent Fossil Beds National Monument have been analyzed in that way and cross-dated to show that a number of those old redwoods were part of a contemporaneous stand. They were living together when an ash or mud flow killed them all. So yes, fossilized wood is, can be used. So I'll spend a little time, because it, it's so fascinating. I love old trees, as, as Linda said. Um, you know, how, how do we know? You know um, is we don't want to be you know, out in the woods, obviously not sampling these guys. Uh, we really don't want to spend much time working with the middle-aged ones, two to 300 years. We really want the, the oldsters, the ones that give us the longest records. So how do we know them out in the field? And so the generic characteristics, well, after a certain point, height growth stops. The tree, the internal algorithm says, I don't need to get any higher. I'm high enough. I'm as high as my neighbors. That's it. Done. And then either you end up with a spike top where it's dead or it's just the crown kind of flattens out like in this ponderosa pine. Um, the limbs are almost more diagnostic than the, the trunk, the size of the trunk. When you've got 
really heavy and gnarled limbs that just look oversized relative to the trunk, that tells you it's an old tree. If the trunk is you know, bent and leaning, you know, the longer the tree is sitting on the landscape, the more likely it is that there's been some earth movement or it suffered some damage and, and regrew uh, a new top. Um, thick bark, uh, and the different species have different bark characteristics, but usually the thicker the better. Large size, I put an asterisk on because that can be very misleading. Uh, size and age are not very well correlated across all of the native conifers. Um, the largest trees are not necessarily the oldest, and the oldest trees may be quite small, a foot in diameter or less. It really depends on the site. And, and so we, we call them sucker trees, the ones, you know, oh, it's this big, and all the others at the site are this big, it must be old. Well, it, it, it's not always the case. You know show you in a bit. So just a little gallery here, uh, a Douglas fir uh, near Lake George growing right out of a rock. So uh, obviously very sensitive to just what is falling right there. Um, and you can see the top is dead. It's allocating its resources elsewhere. Uh, pinion pine uh, near Kremlin. And at some point the slope destabilized and it went over and it's just been growing like that. That is a big that's about as big as pinion get in western Colorado. And then a uh, ponderosa pine down in south central Colorado on the west side of the San Luis Valley near Magote. Uh, again, dead top. And you can see the branches have this beautiful, that's a beautiful open grown ponderosa. It's got large spreading branches, very heavy. And then the bristlecone pines. Um, this is near Platoro in the uh, south San Juans. And this one is just starting to go strip bark at about 900 years old, uh, being cored by my colleague Cody Routson from Arizona. Um, so this is that site I was talking about that was up near tree lines. So this is, here we're at 12,000 feet. And you would think the trees have plenty of moisture. How could they be moisture limited? But it's, you kind of tell from the, the grasses, this is a drier site than most high alpine sites in Colorado. And this part of the South San Juans is a little rain shadowed by the San Juans to the west. And, and so this tree at over 1,500 years old had a really nice moisture signal and a great material to work with and just a beautiful site. Um, this is the kind of ur tree of Colorado. This is the oldest known uh, bristlecone pine, Pinus, uh, Rocky Mountain bristlecone, uh, Pinus aristata. Um, it is not only the oldest known tree in Colorado, it's the oldest known tree in the Rocky Mountains, actually the oldest known tree in the US outside of California, Nevada, and Utah, where the Great Basin bristlecones grow. An extraordinary tree uh, near Fair Play. It's, a, it's about five feet long. It's growing in this kind of pickaback, strip bark form. So the living strip of wood is this. It's right here. And the live branch is here. The rest of the crown is dead. So it's basically been reduced to you know, you know, a tenth or less of its original form. And this is, you call it a, it's, some might say it's a survival strategy to kind of slow things down. But another way to look at it is it's, it's very slowly dying. It's kind of reducing its, its needs and its growth. Um, but it could still live like this for another several hundred years. We don't really know the, the full lifespan of this species. That's an incredible tree. Um, and then, uh, as I've uh, alluded to, and if you looked at any of the samples up here and picked them up and saw what the dates are on the bag, I said, oh my gosh, this has been dead for a thousand years. Um, wood in Colorado, if it's not in contact with a, you know, a deep soil that has microorganisms in it, if it's, especially if it's like this one hanging up on rocks or on a drier soil, it can last for a long time. Once that sapwood goes, the heartwood is very resistant. Here we've got a pinion pine. It was like four feet in diameter at the butt, and we couldn't, it was too rotten down there, so we cut the top. Just this little piece at the top um, had about 800 rings on it, and it's been on the ground for 500 years. Uh, Douglas fir near Dillon. This actually might be, hold it up, that might be it, this piece. So um, 
actually, you know what, it's a different piece, but would have been very similar, same site as this. So this tree was about 700 years at death. It lost the sapwood, so this piece, I think, had about 550 rings on it. It died probably about 700 years ago. Again, we're matching. There it is. You were looking for those diagnostic patterns of wide and narrow rings. We've got living trees at this site that go back almost 800 years. So we've got a nice kind of a nice thing to a you know, long sequence to bridge to with these pieces of dead wood. But it's really matching it, and we do it visually. And then once we measure the rings, we do it statistically and make sure we're 100% confident in that match. Are there error tolerances with those ages? Um, no. <laughs> I say, how can, how can we have a science without error? Um, the error, <laughs> it, it seems fairly arrogant, doesn't it? And sometimes I, I wonder. And I've had colleagues who work with like ice cores where there is error. Uh, radiocarbon dating is usually plus or minus 20 years or 40 years. How, how can we be certain of the exact date? There is error in, say, the measurement of any given ring, okay? Um, there is not error, we believe, in, in the dating of the rings because we have, and you'll see in, in just a minute, with this incredible replication of these patterns within sites and between sites, hundreds of sites in Colorado and across the western U.S., and they are all coherent. You know, like the, the 1925 ring, you see it in the front range, it extends into, into Wyoming, into Nebraska, down into northern New Mexico. And so if we core trees anywhere in that area, we need to see 1925 as a narrow ring. And so we have those diagnostic markers, these diagnostic patterns in a coherent pattern at different spatial scales across the western U.S. And you could argue globally, it's kind of this network of interrelated patterns based on the underlying climate that has driven the tree growth. So I know it's, it's, I, I still get kind of beat on by my colleagues who work with uh, climate proxies that, that do have dating error to them. But until we get way back in time, and yeah, if, if this were like the only sample of this age in Colorado, could I be sure that there wasn't a missing ring in 550 BC? No. I couldn't be. But for the time periods that we'll be talking about today, you know, the last 2,000 years, I think the dating error really is zero. Okay. Oh. And speaking of, oh, we didn't, we really wanted to get to BC. We knew we could get there with bristle cones, and we did. We've got a few sites in Colorado that go back over 2,000 years. We were hoping to get there with one of the big three. This is the closest we got. This is this incredible slope. Uh, it's, it's a slope of gypsum near Eagle, Colorado, very steep. Um, and this tree, the inside date is 202. So 1,800 years ago, it started growing. And um, it had uh, 600 rings on it. So I'm factoring in the sapwood to say it was about 700 years old when it died. And thus it died about 1,100 years ago. And we still had an intact log about... 10 feet long and maybe 10 inches in diameter. Now, that was pretty mind blowing. When was that discovered? Oh, let's see. We went to that site in 2005, I want to say. And actually, dendrochronologists had hit this about every decade since the 40s because it's got such a great signal. So I'm afraid for some of these trees at the site, have probably been cored four or five times. I'm trying to understand how this could not be complete. Yeah, um, here it is, right. I mean, the, the lignans, I mean, the sapwood goes fairly quickly. And, you know, a lot of wood on the ground, branches and so forth, doesn't have any heartwood. It doesn't have those tannins, those resins, those gums that are um, very rot resistant. Um, but the sapwood, or the, sorry, the heartwood is impregnated with those, and it can stick around for a long time. Especially if it's, I mean, you can see this is all mineral. There's virtually no organics. There's really no decay organisms that are working on these pieces of wood. You know, if this were in a wetter climate where they were in contact with the soil, even, you know, think of the Pacific Northwest. You have Douglas fir, you have heartwood. Um, another thing is these are very tight rings. 
And so the structure is very dense too, and that helps. But I think it's the combination of you know, what's in the heartwood, you know, very resistant material, and then not really having many decay organisms. And obviously fire has not visited this site either. There's really not much to carry fire. Yep. Well, on the other hand, how do they live at all? <laughs> Yeah, it is amazing, isn't it? Well, yeah, well, there's, there's a good point, too, is, um, you know, the conditions for germination are more exacting. There's a higher bar for any tree of any species to germinate than for it to persist once it's reached adulthood. And so the conditions might have been better in the past at this site. They may have, most of these trees may have germinated during wetter, at least wetter decades, if not centuries, way back in the past and are persisting through drier or warmer periods now. Will they be replaced? I don't, it really depends. So I think we're, um, any more questions for now? Obviously we can keep, one. yes. How do you count the rain? Yeah, yeah, right. So as I suggested, you know, dendrochronology is not ring counting, right? It's exact calendar dating, cross dating, oh, right, right. but knowing how to count helps especially being able to count backwards when you're working with living trees and you know the outer ring is say you know 2011 if we cord a tree now 2011 2010 09 da, 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 and we make marks every decade and we're doing this on a highly prepared surface i'll talk about that in a bit under a stereo zoom microscope usually between 30 and 40 times magnification so not like microbiology but you know much more than say a hand magnifier lens yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, how do you actually decide if a site is moisture sensitive enough, especially if it's at higher elevation? Right, right. So, you know, some of this, you know, a lot of it, you know, we kind of know, we say a priori. Beforehand, you know, we have this model of what a good site will look like, you know, the elevation, the species, and we're pretty confident. And then we go back to the lab, we measure things up, as I'll describe, and we, you know, statistically, analyze the, the ring widths and compare them to the climate and we, we basically confirm what we knew beforehand. And then there are other sites where we kind of wonder is this too high or is this the wrong species or is this you know a north facing site and we don't know until we get back to the lab. And, but it's surprising that there may be you know, three or four times where we got back to the lab and we were disappointed. We said oh this is much worse than we thought. Um, it's hard to tell a great from a good site when you're out in the field. Um, but the poor sites are relatively few and far between. Maybe that's experience, maybe it's luck. You know, maybe it's just you know, the moisture signal is so ubiquitous across these, especially the big three species. Um, but you know, sometimes you don't know for certain until you get back to the lab, measure it up, compare it to climate, and then go either, wow, that's great, or mm, <laughs> that was too bad. Yeah, yeah. So this sapwood, I, I've been trying, I live at, at about 9,000 feet up near Rollinsville, and I've, I'm, I need to really, I, I, in my abundant free time, uh, want to do a study and figure out how long sapwood lasts under these kinds of conditions. I, anecdotally, I think, you know, no more than 100, 150 years. That's, it's, I presume it's pretty close to that sapwood heartwood boundary that I was showing much earlier. So somewhere in here, I think we're seeing this. And in, in, that, in a 700 year old tree, you know, the heartwood, the fraction that's heartwood would, would have been much bigger and a relatively thin veneer of sapwood. Even if that was 100 rings, it would have been pretty thin. Right, right. Though you, you do get, if you and look carefully at this piece, you do almost get kind of a weathering rind on it. You get lichens, you get, and I wonder if that helps slow the decay, where it, it kind of um, it really kind of stops up any natural pores that might still exist in the wood. Okay, thank you. Um, so I, I think I've alluded to this kind of several times. But this is just a nice, you know, conceptual illustration of, of this idea that,
if we want to find, you know, all trees growing at lower or middle elevations in Colorado will, will likely have some moisture signal, as long as they're not like a riparian tree growing, you know, with the roots in, right in the, the streamside water table. Um, but if we want a strong, the stronger signal, that is the clearer, you know, more variation from year to year reflecting the, the, the forcing of the climate on the tree rings, we want to go to a more stressful site. Um, like the one on the, on the right that has rockier, shallower soils than the one on the left where you've got um, uh, you know, deeper soils closer to the water table. And often you can, you can tell the sites by just the, the slope and how the soils look, but also by the, the look of the trees themselves. You know, trees will just look stressed and, you know, compared to the one on the left. And so <laughs> here's, here's one of our sucker trees. Oh, I just gave it away. Which Doug Fur will tell us more about past climate. So how old is the tree on the right, do you think? Yeah, it's close to 800 years old. That was about the oldest tree. At, at, this is near Green Mountain Reservoir, uh, north of Dillon. You can see not only is it thin soils, the soils are rapidly eroding around the tree. I do wonder if that affected the growth series. Um, this is 20 miles to the south, uh, right closer to Dillon. Um, any guesses on this tree, which is about three times the diameter of that one? No. Yeah, this is 300 years old. This was a classic sucker tree. This is the same site, just a little further down the slope, um, you know, a little more open grown, 700 year old Doug firs. And then we've got this one that's you know, much bigger by far, and it's half the age. And so, it you know, might be a little swale that's hard to tell, that's collecting moisture. Um, so again, same idea. This is actually a bald mountain uh, open space uh, just west of Boulder. We cored some trees up there about six years ago. Um, this is another sucker tree. That was about 140 year old Ponderosa. I thought it would be at least 200, 250. But it's, you know, you just look at the grasses. That's a nice moist site. Um, here, Ponderosa Pine uh, near South Fork, Colorado in the, uh, in the South San Juans. And you can see rocky slope. The ground cover is much sparser. These trees were over 550 years old and a much better moisture signal. And then, so just sort of a, a collage of the, the different sorts of sites that we find ourselves on, usually pretty steep slopes. This is near Golden, Ponderosa Pines, up to 400 years old. Oh, Uniweep Canyon in far western Colorado, great pinyon pine site. Uh, natural Arch in the north part of the San Luis Valley, uh, pinyon pine. Very scary looking site. I did not sample this one. Colleagues did. I'm glad. This is uh, North Crestone, so near the town of Crestone in the San Luis Valley. And here's, uh, again, this Green Mountain uh, site where you've got these really scraggly looking dug firs and dead wood on this very steep shaly slope. And that was a, a great site. So, yes? So when you guys are doing site selection for places that, I mean, looking for new sites that you haven't selected before, do you look at bedrock as an indicator of what, of good places to look? Or how do you look? You know, we probably should. And it's something we've, we've talked about a lot is can we, you know, do, I mean, we can look at geologic maps and really, you know, look at the substrate and the soils. Is the, does the parent material, is it volcanic, granitic, sandstone, does that make a difference to the, the way that the trees record and express the climate signal? We know it does, anecdotally, and there's been some work in Utah to really kind of tease apart what that effect is. Have we used it systematically? No. Um, I, I will say, we, I know for sure here on the front range, we have uh, much better luck uh, sampling on the hogbacks, like ponderosa pine and the hogbacks and sandstone and the other sedimentary formations. Then if you go just a few, literally a few hundred yards to the west and you're on the, say, the Boulder Creek granite. Uh, even though the granite seems to break down into a nice, loose, porous soil, the, the signal is not nearly as good as on the sandstone. So um, it's certainly something we could look into and maybe help us beforehand separate the good from the great sites. Um, but I bet if we really went back and said, okay, look at our great sites, what are the soils? We find that they're probably dominated by sedimentary. 
Um, and there might be some certain qualities to that sedimentary rock, you know, low in certain kinds of nutrients too. Um, so the, the, I've talked several times about the moisture signal, you know, moisture availability, you know, the, the water that comes in is held in the soil so the tree can take it up. Um, obviously, it's, you know, it's ultimately driven by annual precipitation, what falls you know, into the soil. But we can statistically relate it to a number of other variables that have precipitation you know, kind of embedded in them. Uh, you know, dr various drought indices like the Palmer Drought Severity Index, which is based on precipitation with a little temperature thrown in. Um, there's you know, not very long, but there are some measurements of soil moisture in parts of Colorado or modeled soil moisture. Obviously, that we expect to correlate very well with ring width. Uh, April 1 snow water equivalent because you know, that's reflecting the precipitation that falls between at least say September through March. Um, and that's a very important quantity for water management, water supply. And then annual stream flow. Um, and annual in Colorado uh, generally refers to actually the water year, which is the previous October through September. So it's not annual, you know, calendar year annual, it's October through September. So it includes you know, the big peak of runoff, you know, the pr previous fall, you know, up into the late summer. Um, so a little bit about ring width and stream flow, um, because I've, I've suggested that if we want to know something about the, you know, what's flowing in the river, we don't want the trees that are right there in the stream side, in the riparian area, because they won't be moisture stressed. They won't have that signal. So we're looking at the upland trees, how are they're obviously not recording stream flow like stream gauges, but what they are doing is recording the same climate factors that drive stream flow. And that's the combination of precipitation being the big one and also evapotranspiration. So how temperature, humidity, winds kind of suck moisture out of the soil and, and the vegetation before it can get to the stream. And so the tree growth and stream flow are both responding to the same set of components, even though the trees aren't sensing it directly. And again, it's, that, it's the soil column that's acting to integrate what is happening in the atmosphere um, that connects climate and the, the stream flow or runoff. So, okay, now we, we, we start getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, and that is, you know, we've got these beautiful old trees in the field that, that, that have these interesting variation in ring width. How do we turn them into, at least for our purposes, useful data? Um, the first thing we'll talk about is the, the chronology or site chronology. It's the, a time series of annual values, ring width variability, and it's also the building block for the climate or stream flow reconstruction that we'll talk about later. And uh, these, these methods I'm going to talk about, you know, everything from you know, out in the field to the statistics, none of it is really new. I mean, in fact, it's really modern tree ring science is about 100 years old. It started with this gentleman, Andrew Ellicott Douglas, at the University of Arizona. He started as an astronomer, got very interested in weather cycles and where they controlled by the sun, a little maybe fixated about that, um, but realized that trees would give him a longer record of weather cycles to then uh, to, to analyze. Um, he started the first tree ring laboratory at the University of Arizona. One of his uh, protégés was Edmund Shulman, who started working in the 1930s and really is sort of the first dendroclimatologist, systematically using tree rings to, to uh, analyze and reconstruct past climate and stream flow. In fact, here's work he did in 1942 looking at the runoff of the Colorado River. So really all that we've been doing for 70 years is refining <laughs> what Shulman has been doing, and you know, we're doing it on a larger scale, more robust. Statistically, we have computer uh, you know, assisted techniques at various levels that he did not have, but really he had it sussed out 70 years ago. So the first thing we need to do is actually sample the trees. And um, this is another tool that has been maybe slightly refined, but is over 100 years old. This is the increment borer. Uh, developed by foresters in Sweden to non-destructively sample trees so they could determine the ages. And um, it's just basically just a hollow uh, steel tube with a threaded cutting bit. And I did promise a demonstration and I think um, we will still do that. We may kind of do it kind of towards the end as more of an extracurricular activity. 
because uh, the only trees that facilities management would let me core uh, are ones that are going to be killed anyway <laughs> when they expand the rec center next year or the next year. And it's a, a little over a quarter mile away on the far side of the rec center. So I didn't think we could really get the group there, come back. Um, so I think we'll, we'll hold that until the end. But I still, how many people would like to take part in a coring demonstration? Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll work that in. Um, so, and, and a question I had during a break was, is, does it hurt the tree? And I have to, yes, and it causes an injury. Um, you are taking a pencil size plug out of the tree. You're creating a wound. The tr trees have you know, wonderful um, uh, processes to isolate and in their way heal the wound. You know, they don't heal in the way that we do. They basically compartmentalize, restrict any rot that might uh, occur as a result of the wound. And then the, I showed very early on the cross section, they have resin, most uh, the conifer species have resin ducts and they will flood that opening with resin. So I don't need to put you know, a piece of wood or cork in there. The, the tree will close it up, close a wound like that up in a few days, assuming it's healthy. Think of it uh, kind of like a tissue biopsy for a person. Uh, if you're a healthy person or, or just you know, mostly healthy, um, that's not going to cause a big problem. If you already have a systematic infection or you know, other serious immune deficiency, um, that could be problematic or even fatal. Um, so coring a tree is not 100% harmless. Uh, if I cored a tree that already had uh, extensive heart rot, I'm creating another avenue for oxygen and microorganisms and moisture to get in, that's not going to help. Um, but I've revisited many, many sites that we've cored previously. I've never found a dead tree with a hole in it. I do, and they know, they know it's a, you know, it's a 99.9% yeah. that they would just rather not have healthy trees cored. And I, you know, given the aesthetic and other benefits, I am not going to argue with them on that count. So we, we also core a lot of trees at one site. Even though, you know, I showed you we can get a, a phenomenal record, a very good record from a single tree. We want to core lots of trees. Um, it's not that we don't trust any one, but again, we're, we're looking for the common climate signal that's affecting all of the trees. And by coring and then measuring the rings from a number of trees at the same site, we hope to average out any, you know, what we think of as, as noise for our purposes. Oh, an insect attacked this one, or it lost a branch, or it had competition from other trees for some period, but those trees died. Um, we can average all that out if we composite measurements from a few dozen trees at a given site. And almost always they'll be from the same species. Because, um, uh, for example, the big three see climate in slightly different ways, uh, kind of inherently, regardless of the site they're on. So we want to stick with the same species. Um, again, we want to sample really old trees. And if we have dead wood on the site, snags or logs, we'll want to sample that too. Either uh, if it's still you know, pretty solid, we can try coring it. Most often we'll use a chainsaw or handsaw, like uh, how we collected these. Uh, then um, we use a, a space age adhesive called Elmer's to <laughs> glue the cores to these wooden core mounts, if they're cores. Um, if we've got a cross section that's uh, less stable and in more pieces than this, we'll glue it to a piece of down to a piece of plywood before we sand it. And then we do a lot of sanding uh, with first a belt sander, different grits, 150, 220, 320, and then hand sand with 400 grit, 1200. This is in, in the fine furniture territory or even beyond. I, in fact, I think the only people who use 1200 grit are uh, like automobile refinishers who are preparing show pieces. So this is really getting fine because we want those cells, those tracheids to pop out so we can very clearly see the ring boundaries. As if we can't see the ring boundaries, we can't measure them. Well, even before that, if we can't see a ring boundary, we might have a micro ring where the tree grew two or three cells wide in a given year. And if we don't have a good surface, we're not going to see that ring. It'll just blend into the late wood of the previous year. Uh, then again, cross-dating, the pattern matching from tree to tree, assigning calendar years. And if I'm working with wood from a very uh, 
you know, stressful site, say pinyon in central Utah. I'll start with the, kind of the younger trees with the, the widest rings and work my way back into the really ugly stuff. Um, then the fun part. We have a computer assisted, assisted measuring stage. And basically you turn this little crank at one end, you have the sample, you know, just have a little weight to stick it down onto my stage. And I'm basically crawling that sample across my field of view. I've got crosshairs on one of the reticles. And every time I'm at a ring boundary, I press a little button. Beep. And there's a linear encoder. Don't ask me how it works, but it captures the position of the stage to the nearest micron. That's thousandth of a millimeter. Because an individual cell is 20 to 30 microns. These rings, that ring might be 100 to 150 microns, so tenth of a millimeter on really slow growing trees. So we need very high resolution uh, of, of this system. Beep, 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 repeat half a million times and you've measured 100 chronologies, which is what I did from about 2000 to 2009. Um, it's, this is kind of the grunt work, but in order to capture the information, you got to do it. There are some systems out there that use, uh, that are more uh, digital imagery based. You're basically scanning the cores and a system will automatically detect the ring boundaries using fuzzy logic and all the rest. Um, I'm skeptical that that would work, especially when you've got you know, things like bristle cone where you might have 100 rings per inch. I don't think it's going to get all the boundaries. You, know, you can barely see the boundaries of the naked eye or at 40 power. Um, then once you have these raw measurements, you know, here it's in millimeters. Uh, th so these are the ring, what we call the ring, measured ring series. We have to detrend them. This is, uh, if you think about um, just about any tree that you have out in the woods, if you see a stump or you look at a core, the rings are almost always wider in the inside towards the pith and they get narrower as they go to the outside. Is this a function of age? What causes this? Very typical trend. It's, it's, it's really, ge it's, ge it's a function of geometry. Yeah, you've got, you've got this crown, this photosynthetic apparatus that you know, reaches a kind of a maximum point, you know, fairly early on in the tree's life. And so it's growing more or less the same volume of wood every year, but it's got to stretch it over this surface that is expanding with the square of the radius. So you end up with this declining function in growth over time that is almost entirely a function of geometry. There's a little aging going on in there, um, but mostly it's geometry. Um, I mean, you can see it very clearly in this one. The rings start out much larger and then get quickly get smaller. You can see it a little in this, so it looks like more of a step. Um, you can imagine what, what we would make some really faulty inferences if we just put all these measurements together without accounting for that geometric trend. Would, would it be, uh, would it equalize it if you were to calculate the, I mean, I guess you have to have the whole sample, but the area yes. all the way around. Right. The, the area it builds up each year is similar. Yeah, so there, there are, and I've got a colleague in Nevada who's really been strenuously arguing that we should all be thinking about detrending in terms of that basal increment. And even if we don't have cross sections, we should be trying to calculate what the basal increment would be. You know, to think of it not so in, instead of width, one dimension, it's really two dimensions we should be thinking of. Um, but in any case, we have this non-climatic trend that we need to remove. And so we'll fit um, using you know, some function, it might be in this case a spline, a cubic spline, to, to take it out. And then you can see once we've done that, so I'm removing the red line showing the, the trend I'm pulling out, and we're left with you know, the non-geometric related growth trends and variability. And you can see now those two samples sit right on top of each other. What's a drawback of doing this? 
what if we have a what if we do have climatic trends that are at the same kind of wavelength or time period? What's going to happen to them? Yeah. So I mean, this is a, you know a compromise of working, and it's a major compromise of working with triggering data. Is you've got this complication of non-climate related trends in nearly all samples that need to be removed, and in removing them, you're always going to throw out some baby with the bathwater. You might say but we can't do it otherwise. Um, and so what we end up with, instead of measurements in millimeters, we have a ring width index. So a unitless uh, index of, of tree growth. Um, and then once we have these detrended ring width series, so this is a site uh, just down the road about 20 miles. Here we're on one of these sandstone hogbacks, so we've got a really nice climate signal in Ponderosa, and you can see the variability is, you can see it hopefully from back there too, the commonalities. Oh, let me just show, there's 2002 right there for the trees that had it. You can see it's this very sharp point downward. Um, we've also got some remnant wood in here, some dead wood. So these series that end back in the, in this case, the 1600s that we spliced into the longer. Uh, and then we do uh, an averaging basically to reduce all that information to a single time series that we hope will very closely reflect that common climate signal that all of the trees are recording and not the noise that each individual tree is kind of throwing in on top of that signal. 